Many of you may know this, uh, but others may not, and that's totally fine. Um, but my official title here at Park Road Prez is Associate Pastor of Spiritual Formation. And we made that change a year ago uh, for a number of reasons. And I'll highlight some of them. One, with the growth in the areas of uh, children and family ministries that we've had with Jonathan and Alexa being here uh, with us, who are directly working with our youth and our children, my focus has become more about uh, the spiritual direction and spiritual formation of our family ministries as opposed to kind of working directly with our children and uh, youth. Also, second, um, I'm part of kind of helping to guide what we do here with our Sunday classes, with our Bible studies, with the ways that we are gathering together as God's people here at Park Road to grow spiritually, to be formed and shaped spiritually. Uh, how we grow in our discipleship uh, as followers of Jesus. And you'll notice um, that I may use in this time together these next few weeks uh, kind of interchangeable terms, particularly when I talk about spiritual formation and discipleship. And I'll come back to that in a moment when we talk about what those terms uh, exactly mean. Third and finally, uh, and you may know this also, but my uh, doctoral research is in the area of evangelicalism and discipleship and spiritual formation. And so this is an area that I've really enjoyed thinking and reflecting about. And uh, we wanted to carve out a time where we could together think about what it means to follow Jesus, but then more particularly think about how we at Park Road are thinking and uh, kind of strategizing about how we are to follow Jesus together. And so essentially for the next five weeks, what we're going to be discussing is what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Now that sounds very broad, okay? But if I were to define spiritual formation or define discipleship, essentially I would boil it down to that very definition, being formed as a follower of Jesus or being schooled. We'll talk about even the importance of the terms that we use, being schooled as a follower of Jesus. Um, now, traditions of the church will think and reflect upon these things differently. And whatever tradition you uh, came up in, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, how different traditions think about following Jesus and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, be it spiritual formation or discipleship. These terms, more often than not, are born out of different traditions and the way they emphasize following Jesus. Does that make sense? So at the very beginning, I want to uh, tell you that um, when I use these terms, spiritual formation, discipleship, I'm going to be using them pretty interchangeably, even though I think we'll see that they may have some different connotations across traditions. But when I say spiritual formation or when I say discipleship, I'm really talking about essentially the process in which we think about following Jesus or being a disciple of Jesus. Um, lastly, in five weeks, we could never talk about everything, about what it means to follow Jesus, of course. Um, that's an impossible task. But I do want to present ideas that I think are both necessary for us to consider and help to provide perhaps a better understanding of how uh, we're thinking about following Jesus here at Park Road Press. So hopefully by the end, you'll have at least a working idea of what we think it means to follow Jesus and how we're trying to kind of do that here at Park Road. Everybody tracking with me there? That's kind of the big idea and hope that I have uh, for this month together. So to begin today, um, I want to first highlight three very common approaches 
to spiritual formation or discipleship that we have seen throughout history, particularly throughout the history of Protestant Christianity here in America. Uh, next week, we're going to look very specifically at evangelicalism and the way we talk about following Jesus in America. But three very common approaches to this, and I think you'll, you'll understand them, you'll recognize them, you will have experienced them. The first common approach is the educational approach. Okay? This is what we think of when we're doing what we're doing right now. Okay? When we're listening to teaching, we're thinking about Sunday school classes like this one, Sunday school for children. We even use the word school, right? It's an educational type of environment. Any time where there is a pursuit of knowledge that often looks similar to what we do in educational settings, okay? Um, that's what we're talking about when we think about the educational approach to discipleship. Um, these are the settings in which doctrine is taught or discussed, so the teachings and beliefs of the church. The emphasis is uh, placed on Christians growing in their knowledge of God, the Bible, or their knowledge of the church. Not always, but predominantly through their, their intellect, through their mind. Okay? Um, hundreds of years ago, of course, in the 18th century, we had figures like Jonathan Edwards, um, who you know, would be the type of preacher and there were the type of church where he would preach, you know, three times on a Sunday and then they would gather during uh, the week, different evenings of the week, and there'd be other sermons or teachings. This is very much kind of part of our history as Protestant Christians, this type of hearing, didactic type of educational discipleship, okay? Then you get into the middle part of the 20th century, and this is perhaps where we're more influenced by, and depending on your age in the room, you will have experienced these things perhaps differently. We see churches start to specifically adopt what we would call the Sunday school model of discipleship. Uh, perhaps you grew up in this type of church. This is a church that very much over the last 50, 60 years has used and deployed the strategy of the Sunday school model of discipleship. Uh, you may look around town and see these older churches, mid-century modern architecture built in the 50s and 60s. They have a sanctuary that more than likely was built probably in the 20s or 30s. And then what do they have next to them? They have an addition hooked on usually two floors, which was called an education wing, or a Sunday school building. And uh, when we were planting City Church Fort Lauderdale, downtown Fort Lauderdale, we met for a long time in the old First Lutheran Church, which sadly now is actually a bar and an event center. Um, but they had this old sanctuary and then a two-story hooked-on education wing that had, I'm not kidding, like 15 classrooms in it. And I'm thinking, how, when, did you ever use all 15 of those classrooms that were like school classrooms that could fit 20, 25, 30 students? This was, in many ways, the approach to Christian discipleship in the middle part of the 20th century within much of Protestant Christianity. Why? Because the church's understanding, in many ways, of what discipleship meant was to be educated in spiritual things. And so how do we do that? We're going to literally build the space that looks a lot like the education spaces in culture. And so we build a Sunday school building and an education wing to the church. Okay. The second uh, common approach to um, discipleship think that we've seen throughout the last couple of hundred years is what I would call the practice-based approach. So we have the education-based approach and the practice-based approach. This is where our spiritual formation works itself out through practices and actions, okay? So areas of service and mercy and evangelism and community involvement become 
the natural outworking of our discipleship in our lives following Jesus. Often, you'll see um, this where certain individuals or certain churches may emphasize this missional component of following Jesus or being a disciple of Jesus, this component of love for neighbor. And so discipleship then in the life of the Christian is most emphasized or traced by our involvement in the ministries of the church or in other ways, uh, other words, the ways we recognize followers of Jesus is through their active engagement in ministry or in the community. Okay? It's not just about mercy and service, though. We're talking literally just about active engagement in the practices of the church. So your discipleship is kind of measured by your involvement okay? in worship services, events, active engagement more so than growing in knowledge or education is kind of how our discipleship is emphasized. Third, the third common approach that I want to highlight as we begin is what I would call the fellowship approach. Okay, so we've got the education approach, the practice action-based approach, and then third, the fellowship approach. And this is where the call that Jesus makes for us to love one another and be together is held in highest regard. And so What we do as Christians in love and unity together, sharing our lives together, sharing meals together, being together, this is emphasized as kind of the zenith of our following Jesus, our fellowship time. Now, all three of these approaches represent very good things, okay? Of course, they do. All of them represent very necessary components of following Jesus, of being a disciple of Jesus. All three of them provide resources for following Jesus, both as an individual and as an entire uh, congregation. But as I've described just a bit about those three approaches, um, Individuals or congregations can tend to be given to one of these common approaches, perhaps more than another. And you may have grown up in a congregation that emphasized one of those far above the others. Or you may be a type of personality that finds yourself being drawn to or emphasizing within your own personal life this type of approach to following Jesus over another. Um, With today being an introduction, next week we're going to, uh, I want to do kind of a bit of a survey of evangelical history in America and really trace how the movement, which we are kind of receiving from, has defined what it means to follow Jesus. And we're going to see a lot, I think, about how much cultural Um, things are mixed up in that, Uh, but we're also going to see what we've received. What have we received within our traditions of the church that tell us, that have shaped us from a young age up to define what it means to be a follower of Jesus? So that's what we're headed towards uh, next week. And of course, it's important to understand kind of the history of what we received because the strategies for how we think about following Jesus that we're employing together as the church in the 21st century, are impacted, influenced by our history or challenged by whatever it may be. So here is the uh, trajectory of the of the few weeks ahead. I just want to give it to you now uh, since we're doing an introduction today. Uh, Next week, I want to do kind of that survey. Uh, If you're a history person, maybe you'll like that more than others. Um, We're going to Look at the history of evangelicalism, see what we are gaining, see what should be challenged, see what should maybe be left behind. Just be awakened, perhaps, to how Christians like ourselves have um, thought about what it means to follow Jesus over the past 300 years or so. Uh, Week three, then, we're going to look specifically about this idea of mentorship and imitation within discipleship. 
Okay, how mentorship and imitation functions within our following Jesus in the body of Christ. Week four, then, is pr probably the most uh, exciting week that I'm looking forward to because this is kind of um, a framework that I want to introduce to you, which is what I call uh, formational and trustful love. Discipleship as formational and trustful love, and we'll talk about that in week four. And then in week five, my hope is that we'll put it all together and think kind of specifically about how we here at Park Road are kind of following Jesus together. With all that homework and all that part done, we'll kind of think about even the specifics, the gatherings, the ways that we're following Jesus here at Park Road. And hopefully that over those five weeks, we'll leave having a better sense of what it means to follow Jesus and how we're doing it here at Park Road. Okay? Now... To close, and perhaps we'll have a, a few moments of uh, uh, discussion this morning as we close, um, I want to invite you to turn to a scripture passage uh, on the subject of following Jesus that I feel is very important, that most Christians throughout the centuries have seen as very important. Why? Because it comes directly from the Lord Jesus himself, and that's John chapter 13, starting in verse 34. Um, in the Gospel of John, there are these series of chapters, John 13 through 17, which are quite remarkable. You may remember um, that those five chapters, are those five, four chapters, four or five chapters, um, they all take place at the same time, meaning they're all within one setting, and it is the setting of Jesus' last night with his disciples, sharing the Lord's Supper together that we've talked about, that we're celebrating today. Um, it is this long discourse that he gives to them, truly about what it means to be his disciple. And that's unusual in the Gospels. We don't get, you know, often chapters of like one setting. But John 13 through John 17 is that. It is a running discourse of Jesus' thoughts on what it means to be his follower or his disciple. Um, it is, you know, the talk of talks, you know, the class of classes, of course, on discipleship. And so I'd invite you perhaps over the course of these weeks to go back and read through that. We'll probably come back to it and highlight some sections like we will this morning. But look at verse 34 of chapter uh, 13, and this will be familiar to you, I'm sure. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, we may never find a more clear definition of being a disciple of Jesus than what Jesus gives us right there, right? This is how people will know you, will recognize you, will define you as my disciple if you have love for one another. How will people know that you follow me, Jesus says, if you love one another? This will be the defining feature, okay? Later in the same talk, okay, he gives us, though, this incredible illustration of a vine and a tree and branches. If you want to turn to chapter 15, let me read the first few verses of John 15. Another hopefully familiar passage um, that we can reflect on together throughout these weeks to come. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, be it that bear, he is, 
that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And then in verse 8, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. So there again is a pretty direct statement about Jesus, or from Jesus, about what it means to be a disciple or a follower. In chapter 13, people will know you by your love for one another. Then in chapter 15, verse 8, okay, you will prove to me to be my disciples by the fruit that you bear. Okay, so we're getting some early concepts of how Jesus is framing what it means to follow them, him. Um, not only is being uh, a follower of Jesus then, as we see in 13 and 15, uh, not only is it demonstrated by love for one another, although that is a category of it that Jesus gives to us, but Jesus says that our following him is lived out from or based in God himself. Why? We take up residence as Jesus' followers in the love of God. Okay? Think about the vine and the branches and the tree and the call to abide. In other words, the Christian is receiving and giving, receiving and giving as we are in the tree, as we are abiding in God and his love. We are receiving his love for us. We are loving God. We are receiving. We are loving. This is where the followers of Jesus are meant to reside. And so our spiritual formation or our spiritual growth is being impacted by the very place we take up as followers of Jesus, which is in Christ, abiding in his love. And so when you begin to truly value this, that our spiritual growth is distinctly hooked into, does not go anywhere without being in Christ, then our lives begin to take shape and are beginning to be formed by Jesus himself. Okay, um, Eugene Peterson uh, who's written wonderful works on this subject. There's a whole series I would encourage you to read, titles like um, Christ Plays in 10,000 Places, uh, The Jesus Way, um, Tell It Slant. These are kind of a series on discipleship that he wrote. He said this uh, short line that I love. He said, um, that the person that we follow is the primary shaping influence on the person we become. Let me read that again. The person that we follow is the primary shaping influence on the person that we become, and Christians follow Jesus. Okay, pretty simple when you think about it. If you're a follower of Jesus, your life should be shaped by the person you're following. Okay, but as we get into this, we're going to see how over the years and centuries and traditions, we have thought very differently about what it means to follow this person that we're following. Um, I think these common approaches that I've said will emphasize different things about what it means to follow the person that we're following, okay? Um, and we'll need to reflect upon that and kind of even dive into our own personal uh, understanding or personality or background or tradition and think, what are the ways that I've thought specifically about my own discipleship and how I follow Jesus? And what areas of that need to be, um, what other areas of my discipleship do I need to reflect upon or engage or think uh, about maybe for the first time? What other resources do the church uh, provide for my following of Jesus that I've never tapped into, or I've never explored, or I've never seen myself in that way? What are the resources from the traditions of the church do we have? 
that could get us thinking about our following Jesus in a wider, more full way than perhaps the more narrow ways that we often think about following Jesus. Okay? So that's the, um, the, the introduction, okay, uh, that I want to set for us. And then we'll dive next week into some history, thinking about how, uh, and I'm speaking bro- about broadly evangelical history, uh, which is hooked to kind of Protestant history in America, uh, and certainly part of our tradition here at Park Road that we want to think about uh, specifically. Um, but before we close today, I want to just ask, uh, perhaps we could have a few moments of discussion, and uh, hear from you, and just the simple question of thinking back upon your tradition that you grew up in, Okay, whatever that is, your church life, your Christian life, and we all come from different backgrounds and places. Um, what was perhaps the most emphasized aspect of your discipleship or spiritual formation? It doesn't have to be these three things that I said, but it's just as you reflect back, you could say, if I could name it, this is the thing that was most emphasized in my spiritual growth as a child, as a young adult, as an adult, um, that kind of still impacts me to this day. Does anyone care to share? Think about it for a moment. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah. And sometimes um, that can be born from a, a particular tradition's direct understanding of what it means to follow Jesus and that there are practices and works that need to go alongside. Okay, we think about, uh, partic- always comes to mind, more of a Roman Catholic type of uh, approach to uh, spiritual formation. But then there's the kind of the tacit, under the surface type within Protestantism and within evangelicalism that can, within certain local congregations, emphasize works or particular works within this particular culture of a church that really goes to define within that community who is a follower of Jesus and who is not. All right. Anybody else? Let's go Bonnie and then Barry. Yeah. Great. Yes. Uh, Barry. Well, I grew up in a, in a Christian neighborhood. Um, they always emphasized that it was a Christian neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, you know, hundreds of people in that neighborhood are Christians. Yeah. And to this day, anything that any of us do is impacted. Sure. Because we come from yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Of course. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. And so uh, different traditions that emphasize different uh, approaches to worship or different approaches to uh, when the church gathers together. Um, it could take on that feel, you know. We we hear and you know we say these things kind of flippantly, but uh, we'll say, well, and this it's not, you know, we say these things and they're not good to say, but we'll say things like, you know, that church is, you know, a mile wide and an inch deep, you know. What are we saying? We're saying that there there's a lot of breadth to what they're doing, but not a lot of depth to what they're doing. 
But that, in and of itself, is a statement of discipleship and formation that's coming from your own conclusion of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And we could explore it. And what I'm trying to do in this and today and not is not to, you know, uh, diminish or bash or necessarily even at the end of the day put forward kind of an exact view of Christian discipleship, but to get us thinking outside the box perhaps about the fullness of how we can be following Jesus uh, in, a, in a full way that perhaps gets us thinking for the first time outside of just our personal ways that we like to follow Jesus and also outside of our own perhaps traditional background that so greatly, as we've said, has influenced us. And that's a wonderful thing, but we want to think about kind of an even broader view of what it means. Yes. Yeah. 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 Anybody else over here? Anybody? Here we go. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good point. That, uh, and this is, man, next week. We're going to see how much of our uh, evangelical history is fueled by that very idea. Um, that discipleship more often in our evangelical history has been defined by conversion uh, than a full life of uh, following Jesus. And so uh, we'll get into that. Uh, but yeah, some traditions, you know, and uh, I didn't grow up, but there are other people you grew up, you know, where the... Um, the emphasis of the Sunday morning worship service was building towards the call to faith, the call to believe, right? Uh, the altar call or whatever it was at the end, there was going to be a moment at the end of every gathering in which the call to faith to see people converted would be the thing. Now, yeah. Now, what's amazing is you could see, and maybe I think people in those traditions see that as, well, it's just a tack on to our approach that we do. But I would say actually it has become something that has actually defined everything before it. That everything about their worship service and everything about their overall view of discipleship perhaps throughout the church is valuing that moment more than other things. And so we become churches, or some churches become churches who are known for being salvation churches or conversion type of churches. And that's what they focus on. That's what they gear themselves to. The discipleship process kind of starts there, and that's a big influence within that, that community. Um, now, again, we want people to be converted. We want people to come to be followers of Jesus. We want people to respond to the gospel. But we're, I want us to see how all of these kind of views towards our discipleship and spiritual formation flow out into all of the strategies and decisions that local churches and we as individuals make when it comes to how we would set up a worship service, how we would think about my own personal uh, time with Jesus each and every day. If you grew up in a tradition that emphasized what we call quiet times or devos or whatever it is, that's a huge part of how many people define discipleship. And so if I can get 10 minutes every morning in my quiet time, then my discipleship is, is functioning. If I can't, then my discipleship is lagging behind, right? Again, good things. We want to explore, though, the fullness of these things so that we're not, um, we're not limiting ourselves, Right to a particular understanding of a one way of following Jesus. Because when we do that, we lose the potential to see um, the many ways that the body of Christ follows Jesus together. And that's really what I want to lead us to, to think about during this class. Okay? Um, so come back next week, and we'll look forward to that. 
Uh, if you're sticking with us today, we're going to head downstairs for uh, communion uh, first Sunday of the month. If you've already worshipped with us, uh, it was a wonderful time, wonderful service together. So let me pray. If you'd like to talk about this, if you have any observations or questions, please come talk to me afterwards or throughout the week. But we'll continue with this uh, discussion uh, over the next four weeks together. Let me pray. God, thank you for... Um, this time to be together. Thank you that, uh, Lord, no matter where we come from, uh, our tradition, background, um, no matter what personalities we have that uh, perhaps give us over to a particular uh, way or a preference of viewing our discipleship, God, I pray that during this time, these next few weeks, that you would just open our hearts to receive from you, to be stretched to consider some things that we may not have considered before, uh, to open ourselves up to new ways of seeing our discipleship and formation, to be made more like your son, Jesus. God, may we be open to that. May your spirit guide us uh, towards that. May you be gentle to us as you awaken us to these things. And we look forward to uh, the weeks to come and our conversations and our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.